Hello and welcome to the eighth instalment of Society Language Difference, a course by me, Dan Taylor. Um, this week we're going to be looking at the Spinozan turn, which is going to be a curious one because this ostensibly is a course um, about post-war continental philosophy, mainly post-Second World War French philosophy. So why on earth are we going to be looking at this guy? What's he got to do with it? Spinoza, Baruch Spinoza, a 17th century philosopher, metaphysician, lens grinder, a hero, a prince of philosophy for figures as diverse as Bertrand Russell and the figure that we'll be talking about today, Gilles Deleuze. Why are we talking about the 17th century when we're meant to be talking about the 1960s? Well, over the next hour or so, we're going to tell you. Basically, Spinoza is used as a brilliant way of energising and informing um, a turning among some on the left in France um, towards the philosophy and the politics of desire. Now, we talked about this in our previous weeks in our Zoom groups. What does that actually mean, desire? Is all desire normatively good? Surely some desires are not. How do we know that what we desire is valid? We had all this important work and discussion when we looked at Jacques Lacan. So Spinoza and his philosophy has a very important, um, gives a very important emphasis to desire, but desire of a certain sort. So come with me while we while we travel to the 1960s, to the um, 1760s, and let's see what we make of it. So our reading this week um, is from Gilles Deleuze's Spinoza Practical Philosophy, which comes out in 1970, which is meant to be a book about Spinoza, but really it's a book also or primarily about philosophical currents in France. Deleuze says, quote, writers, poets, musicians, filmmakers, painters too, even chance readers may find that they are Spinozists. Indeed, such a thing is more likely for them than for professional philosophers. So we, we, you, you'll have picked this up in the reading. Actually, in, if you're watching this first, I encourage you to try and read um, the bits of Deleuze I've set you. It's not it's not as tough as other bits of Deleuze. Um, at least the first chapter of Spinoza Practical Philosophy. But Deleuze puts this running emphasis on Spinoza not being for academic philosophers. This is someone who gives us philosophy as a way of life, a politics of life. Here he is, a very modern looking Spinoza. Deleuze, again, quote, He is a philosopher who commands an extraordinary conceptual apparatus, one that is highly developed, systematic and scholarly, and yet he is the quintessential object of an immediate unprepared encounter, such that a non-philosopher, or even someone without any formal education, can receive a sudden illumination from him a flash, then it is as if one discovers that one is a Spinozist. Well, I'll put my cards on the table. I am a Spinozist. Uh, maybe I'll persuade you about this as we go along. Let's see what Deleuze means by this idea that you don't need to be a professional philosopher to get something out of this. So this is our agenda um, for, for this recording. The image I'll explain in a moment. The guy at the back is Gilles Deleuze and the guy at the front kind of meditating is Spinoza. We're first going to meet Deleuze, even though it's meant to be a class on Spinoza. We need to know who Deleuze is and how Deleuze is um, Deleuzing <laughs> Spinoza. We're then going to talk about the image and the status of Spinoza in France, philosophically. And then we're going to start getting into some of the um, specific arguments of this short book that I'd, I'd like us to discuss virtually when we meet. What is a practical philosophy? We're then going to turn to what um, Deleuze sets out as the triple illusion that he claims Spinoza dispels, disrupts. I want you to think here about the illusions, the delusions that we have been coming across and debating on our course. We know the ways that we've talked about racism, fascism, consumerism. Why is it that Deleuze wants to look at the way a 17th century philosopher um, removes the scales from our eyes? Well, it has a, a lot of kind of timely importance. We're then going to look at the legacy of um, Spinoza in France. This sounds like it could be a huge lecture. It won't be. And um, for that, we're going to be looking at the um, 
the influence of Spinoza in subsequent leftist form, Antonio Negri in particular. Okay, let's get into it. Part one, introducing Gilles Deleuze. Here he is. I'm going to begin actually not by just telling you a load of biographical facts about this man whose life uh, traverses much of the 20th century, but by kind of getting us into the world of his thinking, the world of Deleuze's thought, which I imagine he would want his own biography to be told through. So Deleuze says um, in a book that he kind of writes with another man, Felix Guattari, who we'll talk about in a moment, a book called What is Philosophy, which is a great book, although Deleuze pretty much writes himself. Deleuze says that, and what well, Deleuze is saying out his definition of what philosophy is, and I think it's a good way of thinking about what characterizes Deleuze's own philosophy. And he says that philosophy is the art of forming, inventing, and fabricating concepts. It's something that's wholly creative, spontaneous. Its activity is in innovating. There's also then an emphasis on difference and novelty, and that's important too. There's Deleuze, slightly younger. Uh, elsewhere in a series of a book of collected essays called Negotiations, uh, Deleuze writes, Abstractions explain nothing. They themselves have to be explained. There are no such things as universals. There's nothing transcendent, no unity, subject or object reason there are only processes sometimes unifying subjectifying rationalizing but just processes all the same now you might be thinking here of derrida i know derrida was difficult but the work that we did on derrida the emphasis there on on difference deconstruction his critique of the metaphysics of presence we're going to see we, i need you in your mind to link deleuze with this kind of project of difference, of alterity, of creativity. Both of them, Friedrich Nietzsche is important, as he was a Foucault. And you could keep these three in mind, Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze. They don't all think the same, far from it. They don't all agree. Although Foucault and Deleuze are close, relatively close together. But all of them are emphasizing thinking as an act of activity and thinking therefore as something with great cultural, social, even political importance. Now, if you are a public intellectual, you've got to, uh, it's important that you could, you're, you're telegenic, you're photogenic. Um, and there are, this is a particularly cool looking picture of Deleuze um, posing in front of a mirror with their, is it mise en abîme? A kind of endless corridor of mirrors. So for Deleuze, philosophy needs to be disruptive. It needs to be radical. It needs to break down and challenge our tradition, what we traditionally believe. This is something that comes out in a book that he writes called Difference and Repetition, which is a very important statement of his philosophy, but it's kind of difficult to immediately make much sense, of, sense out of. I'll talk about some of the arguments of difference and repetition in a moment. But Deleuze says here, again, we're trying to get the flavour of the man. He says, quote, Thought is primarily trespass and violence, the enemy, and nothing presupposes philosophy. Everything begins with misosophy, like like hate, like I guess, like hatred of wisdom, I suppose, anti-wisdom. Do not count upon thought to ensure the relative necessity of what it thinks. Rather, count upon the contingency of an encounter with that which forces thought to raise up and educate the absolute necessity of an act of thought or a passion to think. Well, it's slightly dense. I'm now regretting not having put in that quotation in front of you on the screen. I guess what we're seeing here is the emphasis on an encounter with something different, with difference to challenge thinking to think. The contingency of an encounter, something which forces our thoughts, our ideas to raise up and educate the necessity of an act to think. Thinking requires prompts, requires causes, requires spurs, requires drive, requires desire, requires difference. Thinking doesn't just happen. And we can probably sense in this a wider mood, an ambience, an atmosphere of what we talked about last week, May 68. Counterculture. A new society. The refusal of all constraints. Some of the material that we looked at with Guy Debord and Raoul Vanagem. 
And here we are with Deleuze. So Foucault is a friend of Deleuze. He's got this great line. Um, he says, perhaps one day this century will be known as Deleuzean. <laughs> I don't know. It hasn't happened yet. But Deleuze, well, Foucault is, I think, the most cited um, scholar in the social sciences. And Deleuze probably isn't that far behind. Now, what is it about Deleuze's ideas that are so important and so radical? Well, what's interesting about Deleuze is that he really covers quite a, a wide range of topics within philosophy. Some of you might know of his work through his writing on cinema. Uh, he writes on, on painting, from the painter Francis Bacon. He writes on cinema. Well, I just mentioned that, mate. <laughs> he writes on. Um, he writes mainly on the history of philosophy, uh, and some of his works, like Anti Oedipus, that he writes with Felix Guattari, which we'll talk about next week, have a strong political dimension, I suppose, as well. All of these works are kind of reflecting an, an avant-garde approach and sensibility to philosophy. Something that is creative, which is striving at difference. And it's interesting to kind of relate that to his own life, which I know I said we shouldn't do too much, but let's just do it a little bit. So he's born in 1925 in Paris to a middle class family. And he spends his working life really as an academic. You know, he's teaching in lycées and secondary schools, I think, in his 20s or maybe up to his early 30s. Um, but for most of his life, he's a, a radical academic. He has two children. Um, and we mentioned this, actually, we were talking about suicide last week. He takes his own life, I think, in the year 1995, so at some point in the 90s, having suffered from a very, a very debilitating lung condition for quite some time. His life is also marked by a, a degree, I suppose, of poor health, particularly towards the end. Now, an important event for Deleuze is the death of his older brother, um, who fought in the French resistance and died en route to Auschwitz. Deleuze writes, um, well, he begins writing kind of works in the history of philosophy from the, from the early 1950s onwards, the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and these kind of cover what are at the time quite out of fashion thinkers like David Hume, you know, Scottish empiricist, certainly wasn't cool. Um, Friedrich Nietzsche, the reclamation of Nietzsche, which is happening with Foucault also to, to a large extent happens through Deleuze. Another good way of getting into Deleuze is to look at his book on Nietzsche, um, which I think comes out in the early 1960s. He writes on Immanuel Kant. He writes on Henri Bergson. He writes, of course, on Spinoza. He writes on Leibniz. There's a lot of work in the history of philosophy, but his approach is very unconventional. It's about creating new concepts, reading new ideas within traditional thinkers. There's something radical, maybe even heretical about that approach. And if it's not through the writing on cinema, um, or maybe art, then you probably will have come across Deleuze through the work with Guattari, Anti-Oedipus, or A Thousand Plateaus. Or maybe you've read... Or looked at what is philosophy, which is a lovely book. They also write a book on Franz Kafka together as well. Here they are. Now we're going to look at the creative partnership of Deleuze on the left and Guattari on the right next week. We're going to give it its due. A brilliant, wonderful pairing and a very kind of creative and enrich and an enriching pairing for both. There's kind of traditionally this view that. Um, the work with Guattari is, um, you know, if there's anything good in it, it must have been written by Deleuze. Um, and also that, you know, because it's written in a more experimental way, this is actually, you know, Deleuze's quality has been diluted and watered down by the collaboration with Guattari. You know, we're not going to argue this. We're not going to think this at all. Guattari is a, is a very important figure in his own right. Um, and it's it's fascinating how they work together. Anyway, let's, let's talk about what characterizes Deleuze's own philosophy. Well, I've mentioned creativity and difference, alterity. As a broader principle, there's a real emphasis on life. Life, philosophically, philosophies of life are known as vitalist, vitalism, lifeism. Now, you might think, what does that mean to be in favour of life over death? Isn't everything like that? But it's more the case that thinking itself shouldn't be preoccupied with what is morose or, or death-oriented, maybe something that... Deleuze would see possibly at play in Heidegger, maybe in Georges Bataille. 
um, and instead philosophy needs to be kind of directed towards joy, towards human power, towards living in the here and now, not towards fear, not towards despair or anger or hatred. So there's that there, there's an emphasis on otherness, on openness, Nietzsche and Spinoza, <laughs> somewhat unlikely pairing, but very important to Deleuze, both scandalizing thinkers, radical thinkers, both have a lot to say about desire and the will, the will to power, Spinoza desire, both are, at, are the kind of, through both can we understand human power, but not just that. Um, Deleuze you, draws on quite a wide range of, of topics and areas of interest. You see this in particular in A, a Thousand Plateau of Guitar. It's, it's maths and science there as well. A lot of literature, music, art, anthropology. Um, some key concepts, I'll explain some of them in a little bit. Um, difference, difference versus repetition. Imminence, this is a Spinozan concept, I need to explain that. Um, no, um, I don't want to let all this stuff float away. Like Imminence, basically. Um, imminence should be juxtaposed against transcendence and you need to think of this in terms of God. God traditionally in the, in the Christian view in the Bible is a human-like being or, or, or a perfect who is outside of human affairs and can direct them you know by performing miracles and so on to transcend to be outside. But for Spinoza and for Deleuze God, well for Spinoza, Spinoza talks about God, Deleuze doesn't, um, for Spinoza, God is imminent. God is not on the outside. God is inside. And it's not just that God is inside the universe. God is the universe. And we are therefore parts or modes, but only said, of God's power. Everything is here then. There's no, there should be no fear of death because life is everything that there is. The encounter is also important. Being active, not reactive. This we'll look at more with Antidipus next week. Deleuze does become a bit of a, a philosophical personality. We can see this is a great image. You can see Deleuze there. The camera kind of captures him most kind of in the center, just to the left. But who's that man with the glasses on the right? You might recognize. Yes, it's Jean Paul Sartre. And on the far right is Foucault. This is another image of Deleuze and Guattari. And if you, yeah, if you kind of, if you take a look, or you might already be familiar with A Thousand Plateau, um, it's just really experimental and it draws on so much and it can be read in any order. And there's this interest in experimental music and so forth. The book on Francis Bacon is really interesting. If you're interested in Francis Bacon as a painter, this is a book that's well worth reading. Um, and it's just a really interesting kind of, um, I guess, exploration of what makes Bacon's philosophy kind of striking. What, what those disintegrating bodies might mean, what they tell us, zones of intensity. And this image, which I promised I'd explain to you earlier, although I felt slightly embarrassed, but I shouldn't be such a, a prude, um, <laughs> is how it relates to how Deleuze uh, claimed jokingly um, that how he read other philosophers, that what he did is um, he would bugger them, he would sodomize them um, in order to kind of produce monstrous children, which were uh, neither <laughs> holy Deleuze nor holy the philosopher in question. Keep this in mind with Spinoza. So basically what Deleuze is saying is that he's reading the history of philosophy and reading philosophers in a creative, in the, independent minded and inventive way. And so the concepts that he draws out and when he says that Spinoza is a philosopher of joy, Yes, you know, your traditional Spinoza scholar could accept that to a point, but Deleuze really makes a large and unusual emphasis on certain things. That's what we're going to draw out. That's why this book on Spinoza, Spinoza's Practical Philosophy, isn't really about Spinoza. It is, of course it is, but it's also a lot about Deleuze, and it's um, it's one of the best ways of, of seeing Deleuze kind of popularise or explain his philosophy to a wider public. That's why we're looking at it. Okay, right here. Hopefully I've made this graph work this time. It came out rather rubbish last week. So this is some a timeline of Charles Deleuze. Yes, that one came out okay. <laughs> An early work of his, Empiricism and Subjectivity, which sounds like it could be quite boring, but um, this is a, an interesting, quite creative way of looking at David Hume. Ne the Nietzsche book is important for the 
re-entrance of Nietzsche into French ideas, 1962. Bergson, Bergsonism, 66, and we're going to start, we're going to see the publication start heating up. I saw this with Derrida, remember Derrida's year, 67, or well, the 72 is enough one. It starts heating up for Deleuze. Maybe the whole time is heating up, isn't it? 1968, two major books come out. They're both part of Deleuze's Doctora. Difference and Repetition, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but not that much. And Spinoza and the Problem of Expression. And you might be thinking, hold on a minute. Dan's asked us to read Spinoza Practical Philosophy, and yet there's enough of Spinoza book. Yes, there is. Um, it's a great book, um, Spinoza and the Problem of Expressionism. Uh, problem of Expression, or it's, or it's sometimes translated as Expressionism. Um, but it's more dense, um, and I thought we, uh, you as new readers, would get more out of Spinoza Practical Philosophy. But if you like the Spinoza Deleuze connection, this is, should be your next point of call. Um, this comes out in 68. In 69, enough a major Deleuze book comes out, The Logic of Sense. There's some engagement with Lacan in that. Deleuze gets a job at Paris 8, this kind of experimental, radical new university um, with a, a very innovative philosophy program headed up by Foucault. Um, Lucia Rigore, who we'll meet in a couple of weeks' time, is also based there. It's a really interesting moment. He meets Felix Guitar in 69. 70, that's important for us because of this book. 72 is when Anti-Oedipus comes out with Guitar. That's what we're going to look at next week because it's a bestseller. If you've not read it yet, when you read it, you'll be surprised. It's a wonderful book. It's a book that's hard. A Thousand Plateau, very experimental and interesting book, comes out eight years later. The books on cinema, or, or two books on cinema, come out over the 80s. What is Philosophy? A very late book with guitar. Enough a great read. Okay, right, so this is Deleuze. Now let's get to Spinoza in France. Right, so Spinoza. Here he is. Now Spinoza is, um, has been described by the scholar Hassan Ashok as a philosopher of many posthumous births, somebody whose image and influence is reborn, reclaimed in different generations to different purposes. And so there are different Spinozas, different Spinozisms. Now, Spinoza, in his own time, in the 17th century, well, he tried to kind of keep his work slightly under wraps because it was so scandalous in his view of God, and we'll come to that in a moment. But towards the end of his life, he is known as a, as, a, as somebody who's blasphemous. You know, his book um, is a book forged in hell. Um, he's seen as, you know, very ungodly for lots of reasons. One is the view of God. One is the uh, denial that human beings have free will. And Spinoza has this kind of scandalous reputation in his time and shortly after. Then uh, later on, he has an influence over in the over in 18th century Enlightenment figures, Dolbach, Diderot, and others. Partly because there's a really popular philosophical uh, dictionary that is produced by a man called Pierre Bayle, um, which is read all is read all across Europe. Um, and Bale kind of writes a huge entry on Spinoza in order to kind of refute him, but <laughs> it's a problem, isn't it? If you um, sometimes if nowadays if you ban a record, people want, want to listen to it more. And there's something about the very detailed and very careful um, critique of Spinoza that Bale gives that basically ends up kind of extending and popularizing Spinoza's ideas across 18th century Europe. So Spinoza is a, a subterranean influence in the Enlightenment. We'll come, come to that a bit more in a moment. Then in the time of Hegel, Hegel is important for us in this course, he is, becomes he becomes reclaimed as a, as a great figure. He um, is important to um, Goethe, to Lessing, um, to Jacobi, and, and there's a whole dispute among them around pantheism, the view that God is everywhere, God is manifested in all things. How, and how some people saw Spinoza as being pantheistic, which he kind of is, um, and how this was a, 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 kind of a wonderful thing for the Romantics who were in awe of nature. All right, we're meant to talk about France, though, aren't we? Let's 
how does it relate to this man? Rather handsome looking uh, guy. This is a guy in a French resistance, uh, Jean Cavalier. Well, Spinoza kind of by the late 19th century is kind of is an important figure in in, in what we now call rationalism. Somebody who's seen as kind of emphasizing the rigorous and great powers of human reason to understand nature and the universe. And this is important. And this is how Spinoza then becomes reclaimed in France. Now we're getting there in the mid 20th century. Spinoza's always kind of been a, a fixture um, in modern French philosophical education anyway. Um, so some of you will know, you'll know directly, like one of our students, Christophe, um, that in France, um, philosophy is part, of, is part of the school curriculum in a way that I think it's also true in Italy, um, but it's not the case in the UK. Yeah, of course it isn't. Uh, <laughs> um, but... Usually what is taught um, by Spinoza, well, on his philosophy curriculum, those Spinoza usually features, but it's usually a short early work by Spinoza called The Treatise on the Emendation of the Intellect. It's a lovely short treatise. Um, now, Spinoza becomes an important figure in mid-20th century France because he's used as a um, as an icon or as a mascot for a new intellectual and philosophical conflict that is taking place. Um, and this goes back to some of the stuff that we looked at um, in previous weeks around phenomenology. You might remember this with Jacques Derrida, something that is um, developed by Edmund Husserl uh, and later Heidegger in a slightly different way. And it's this emphasis on focusing philosophy, on not seeing philosophy as a kind of um, secondhand, um, you know, science, you know, in the way that the positivists did. Philosophy can never, you know, give you something that's pseudo mathematical, they thought. Instead, what makes philosophy valuable is that it can explain and helps explore human consciousness, and it makes consciousness its subject. Direct human experience becomes our subject. Which all sounds great, doesn't it? Well, we've had critiques of phenomenology already. What, who is the subject that we are studying? And is there such a thing as a universal self? Are, is there, are there not Eurocentric notions here? How can we be sure that we're connecting to something that is universally outside of language? You know, Derrida presented all these interesting challenges. You might want to think of Lacan as well. Now, our handsome guy on a machine gun here was also challenging this in a, in a different way. Jean Cavalier and others. For them, they're worried about phenomenology. They're worried because if we're going to just talk about subjectivity and consciousness, we're drifting away from what makes philosophy hard and edgy, what makes philosophy challenging to the myths and mediocre thinking of the status quo. We need reason. We need reasons, uh, demands for clarity and consistency in thinking. We need reason to puncture illusion. We need reason in order to um, respond to the ways in which advertising, consumerism and so on, you know, degrade what it means to think. Why should we give up on the rationalist project? This is important. This is a poster stamp for Kawaii. And this is a lovely kind of calling card. Um, Kawaii says, I'm a Spinozist. We must resist, fight and confront death. Truth and reason demand it. Now, if you're looking at the poster stamp, you'll see his years are relatively short. Dies at the age of 31. He dies as a resistance fighter. So for Kavai and, and Kavai and other thinkers um, later on, um, who are influenced by Spinoza, he, he's a, a kind of a bulwark to, to some of the dangers that we've talked about in our discussions. If we're just talking about subjectivity, or if we're talking about a kind of a universal kind of collective conscious or, or geist, zeitgeist, like we get in Hegel. And this is worrying. This, this could be something about this which enables us to um, subtly impose very Eurocentric notions. This, could, this is worrying. Uh, in, uh, other important kind of French rationalists, I'm using this term slightly carefully, um, he used Spinoza, uh, Marshall Giroux, who writes two major important works on Spinoza. Um, Alquier, Desanti, Gilles Deleuze, 
<laughs> we'll talk about him. Louis Alfusser, you'll meet him in a moment. Alexander Maffron is enough and not very well known at all in the English speaking world, but writes a major book on Spinoza and offers mm. subsequently. Um, in English, it's called um, Individual and Community in Spinoza. So we have these kind of thinkers returning to Spinoza from the 40s into the 50s into the 1960s. They want to turn away from something that is overly subjective, vague, in favour of a project of rigorous in interrogation and examination of nature and belief that we get in Spinoza's ethics. Now this is a, oh yeah, sorry, I should say um, that um, the reason why I'm using that term French rationalist slightly guardedly is because um, I'm drawing on here, and if you're interested in this stuff, um, a good book on this is Spinoza Contra Phenomenology by uh, Knox Peden, uh, which came out, I think, five, ten years ago. Really good book. And it uh, does a kind of intellectual history of France in the mid-20th century. There's a lot on Deleuze and Alfred there. And he sees he basically sees the turn to Spinoza as being a kind of a kind of fight back against phenomenology and the you know the unreason that might be associated with it. Knox Peden has a great quote. He says, um, every philosopher has two philosophies, Spinoza's and his own. Now what is Spinoza's philosophy? Well this oh, is this <laughs> setting out a question that's going to be too difficult. Well, um, I alluded to the different Spinozas throughout history. This is um, this is not a contemporary image. This is Spinoza being shunned by the bearded old man, Jewish man behind him. The famous event in Spinoza's life is that he is excommunicated from the Jewish community that he had been born into and was a part of in Amsterdam. Spinoza has a relatively short life. Um, he's born in 1632. And dies in 1677. So he's, he dies at the age of 44, 45, which isn't particularly long in this period. He's a philosopher, also a lens grinder. Um, he's kind of known then as now for his unconventional views on God. I talked about this in terms of imminence earlier. He's also one of the first people to really understand well and write about the philosophy of Descartes, who was nearly his contemporary. Descartes was born a couple of decades earlier, I think. This is all from memory. Um, Spinoza's major work is The Ethics, which comes out in 1677 after he dies, but he also writes an important work in his own time, The Theological Political Treatise, which he publishes anonymously in 1670 in the midst of a kind of you know, political and social crisis. And it makes the case for separating church and state. Um, it makes it a really powerful argument for democracy. Um, and it critiques things like miracles. It says that the Bible should be largely understood not literally but metaphorically is telling us and teaching important truths about how to live well with each other it's also an important um, statement of free speech these are very liberal ideas we associate them more with the following century and spinoza makes them beautifully and stridently in the theological political treaties and he tries to keep it anonymous but it ends up getting associated with him a really important and intriguing figure I mentioned the Enlightenment link, and again, because Spinoza is my, my real object of study, um, I could just talk about it forever and ever, so I won't. Um, if, you want, if, you're, if you want to know more about Spinoza, send me an email. I've taught a lot of courses on Spinoza, and I can point you to a lot of really good, accessible material. Now, Jonathan Israel writes a great book about the Enlightenment, which has got quite a strong argument behind it, which some scholars think is too simplistic. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting way of thinking about Spinoza's significance. It's called Radical Enlightenment. And it came out in 95, and he's written subsequent books about the Enlightenment. And his big point is that Spinoza's a secret influence over much of what happens in the 18th century, over people like, um, well, no, well, he kind of, I should say, he presents a radical Enlightenment and a moderate Enlightenment. Moderate Enlightenment is, you know, doesn't go far enough. It's John Locke, Immanuel Kant, I think even Rousseau. Yes, there's this kind of emphasis on human reason being a source of liberation, but these guys also want to keep the old religious structures in place. They're not socially radical. You know, they're more in favour of the status quo. Voltaire would be enough a moderate. But the radicals are different. They're pushing, they're charging. Materialism all the way. Julien Doffre de la Maitrie. 
doled back is enough. There's a great line by Israel on the significance of Spinoza. Let me give it to you. I'll just bring back up this wonderful image too. Jonathan, Jonathan Israel, quote, Spinoza then emerged as the supreme philosophical bogeyman of early Enlightenment Europe. Admittedly, historians have rarely emphasised this. It has been much more common and still is to claim that Spinoza was rarely understood and had very little influence. In fact, no one else during the century 1650 to 1750 remotely rivaled Spinoza's notoriety as the chief challenger of the fundamentals of revealed religion. This is like religion revealed through like prophecy and certain miracles. Received ideas, tradition, morality, and what was everywhere regarded in absolutist and non-absolutist states alike as divinely constituted political authority. So this is our guy. And we can probably get a sense here of why he would be important for some of the philosophical trends that we're, we're thinking about. This is another striking image. You've got the Ouroboros in the snake that eats itself, just to the left of Spinoza. And here's a really enough a really interesting image that you can present Spinoza as both a Jew and an atheist. Scandalous things in this time. Jewish people are, are just about tolerated in only a small number of parts of Europe at this point. During Spinoza's lifetime, Jews were formally allowed to return to England by Oliver Cromwell after um a four four hundred year absence, four hundred year kind of forced exile now how does all that relate to this guy louis alfusser well alfusser interesting um very interesting and important figure um in i guess cultural studies cultural theory as we now understand it a very important and influential thing on the french left at this time too somebody whose aim was to create a more scientific socialism an understanding of Marx and the Marxist approach to history, historical materialism, but one which tried to present Marx's theories and approach with the same kind of clarity and precision as a physical science, which we would nowadays you know, reject, but that's what he tries to do. Alfred Serre, if you know him, you're probably thinking, ah, oh, he's the guy that killed his wife. And there is that whole biographical kind of horror really that hangs over him and hangs over how we receive somebody like Althusser, a man who battled with serious mental health problems. Again more popular, more influential in the 60s, but he still does some important work in the 70s and 80s. Um, probably the most well-known concept is the, the well two actually, one is the concept of interpolation which I should have written down, sorry. Um, which is this kind of in, interpolate. He makes, Althusser says, you know, it's talking about how we understand our own identities and how these are kind of socially constructed, but they're kind of shaped and impressed upon us in our immediate relations with others. And he gives the example of being shouted at by a policeman in the street, being addressed, being hailed, and the ways in which that kind of places us in a kind of subjectivity, maybe a kind of one of fear, one of inferiority, maybe, but in which there is a wider social structure and social hierarchy that conditions and reinforces what we are. It interpolates us. Our identity isn't just something on the inside of our heads, it's outside of our bodies, too. Enough of the second important concept that I was thinking of um, is ideology, ideological state apparatus. I'll say more about this in a moment. I feel like this is, you know, this is hard to think about already. Um, so Althusser is um, teaching, and, it, and one of his major influences in this period is as a teacher. Um, he has a group of students around him who end up becoming very influential themselves, people like Etienne Balabar, um, Jacques Rancière. And, they to, and so Althusser teaches various courses on different philosophers over the 1960s, Machiavelli, Rousseau, or others. He teaches a lot on Spinoza, but no lecture notes survive. And what's interesting about Althusser is that he teaches and has a lot to say about Spinoza, but very little was written down. And he did plan to write a major book on Spinoza. Um, but when he saw that one of his colleagues, 
Alexander Maffron had written a book on Spinoza, Individual and Community in Spinoza. He, he basically said, apparently, well, this book says everything that I was going to say anyway, so I'm just not going to bother. So we just don't know what he would have said. Anyway, Alfred Serre forms um, a group, or well, he's part of a group called the Spinoza Group, Group Spinoza, a secret group, secret society with 16 members, um, and including um, Balabar, Pierre Macheret, another one who writes an important work on Spinoza, English Hegel, but you, Alpha Sayer, did a little. Uh, yeah. Um, and so what Alpha Sayer wanted to do is, because um, he's, he's a Marxist, a self conscious Marxist, and he's trying to kind of refine, calibrate, reshape the Marxist project, which is, you know, hit a number of skids, really, or it's kind of hit, hit the rocks in a lot of ways. Um, because of the um, increased awareness of persecution and gulags and so on in the Soviet Union, because of the um, violent put down of the democratic workers uprising in Hungary and later Prague. What kind of Marxism, what kind of communism are we after if it's not a Soviet sort? Or maybe what we see in the Soviet Union and then later with China, Mao's China, is the logic of Marxism, that it was always going to end in a kind of dictation. So the Marxist project is, is Marxism is under a lot of strains at this point. You might want to think, in, think here too about the ways in which Charles de Gaulle, we talked about this last week, was able to be re-elected on a landslide in June 1968. One of the things that he said that made him kind of persuasive to frighten voters was the fear of a communist takeover. This idea that, you know, kind of com the official um, the F Communist Party of France, the view that it was kind of in leagues or it was um, a vehicle of Soviet military ambitions. And this fear worked, didn't it? This the landslide for a previously very unpopular leader. So this has got nothing to do with France, does it? <laughs> this is a late eighteenth century image um of the um court of one of the sultans of the Ottoman Empire, I can't remember which one, Selim the second or third. I look, I really like this. I find this image really interesting because of the kind of the rigid organization of bodies, um, if that makes sense. The ways in which power, political power, religious power is often based around the ability to kind of direct, organize and manage, steer other human bodies, subordinate bodies, place them in lines, place them in queues, require certain uniforms, require certain behaviors, certain bows, certain forms of supplication. Now, when Alfred says looking at Spinoza and the sh few short extracts that do survive, and what I recommend looking at is this collection called The New Spinoza. So, and, and it's in English, and it's just a collection of French writers writing about Spinoza um, that's been translated and edited by Warren Montag and Ted Stoll's great book. Um, Alfred says is interested in the way that Spinoza talks about um, the Jewish people in the theological political treaties. To, it's a wide, it's a wide reaching book, this. And Spinoza writes about um, Jewish culture and he asks the question, why is it that Jewish people have survived from ancient antiquity to today? And one of the things that he points, he says, is their xenophobia. Remember, Spinoza has been ejected out of the Jewish community because, well, because of his unconventional beliefs about God. Um, and also one of the biographical reasons because it seems he went bankrupt. He was a businessman before a philosopher and a war between the Netherlands and England ruins um, all the trade you know, between the Netherlands and the New World. So if you've got a business that imports fruit, luxury fruit, dried fruit, like Spinoza did, then you're bankrupt. And what do you then? What do you do then if you're bankrupt? What do you do if you're bankrupt and you owe money to other people? And Spinoza ends up getting the secular courts to help him out. This is sometimes seen as enough reason why he's rejected. But let's, you're probably thinking, this doesn't sound romantic. Let's go with the whole, he was kicked out because he was policing. Okay, <laughs> let, let's have that. Um, so Spinoza, when he writes about the Jewish people in the Theological Political Treatise, let's just call it a TTP, okay. Um, he says, well, they were able to survive for their xenophobia because they saw themselves as a distinct people from others. And they, and they had a very kind of strict set of rules, the Ten Commandments, and also all the prohibitions in the book of Leviticus which all about kind of saying what Jewish people could and couldn't do. There's a lot of kind of strict um, forbidding of, you know, mixing with us too much or worshipping other people's gods, you know, definitely not. Um, 
there's a lot of emphasis on distinct custom, custom diff, distinct forms of worship, regular forms of worship, clothing, circumcision. Um, and this kind of this this and many other things were what kind of enabled the Jewish people to remain a coherent and singular people, a people even though they didn't have their own nation state for a very long time up until you know the nineteen forties. Now Alpha Sale looks at Spinoza's analysis of the Jewish people and says this tells us about ideology. Ideology isn't just about thoughts in people's head, it isn't just about hegemony, as Gramsci would say, it's about bodies. It's about the materiality of bodies, it's about symbolism in buildings, it's about having to be in certain buildings, to be in certain lines, to wear certain clothing in certain places for certain people, for certain purposes. Officer Alphuset says, quote, he rediscovered in it, Spinoza, rediscovered in Spinoza, what I then called the materiality of the very existence of ideology. Maybe we could, this is kind of where I'm going up with this image here. That ideology isn't just, you know, for, for this, as the situation said, it was about the spectacle, about advertising, about the image. Althusser, Foucault, Spinoza, power isn't just about images. It's not just about representations in our mind. It's about the organization of bodies. As Foucault would say in Discipline and Punish, which comes out in 75, a bit later after this, it's about the discipline of bodies, disciplinary power. This is the wheel of fortune. <laughs> um, Alpha Set also says about this. Well, I'll just read this out to you. This is, really, this is an interesting way of thinking about the significance of Spinoza in France. He says, quote, I noted that the truth of a philosophy lies entirely in its effects. Like the effects that it caused. While in fact it acts only at a distance from real objects. Therefore, in the space of freedom that it opens up to research and action and not in its form of exposition alone. So philosophy is about the, the real world effects that produce, not just about the ideas, the content of the ideas themselves. He continues. There is no more cogito in Spinoza, but only the factual proposition homo cogitat, which means man thinks. No more transcendental subject in Hegel, but a subject as process. Okay, sorry, that was a little bit dense. To say that there's no more cogito is a reference to Descartes, cog the cogito argument, which is, I think, I think, therefore I am. Spinoza doesn't say, I think, therefore I am. He's not really interested in the self or the subject. He doesn't begin the ethics with I, me, looking at things. He begins with substance. He doesn't try to do philosophy in terms of one thinking brain trying to understand its place in the world. He just wants to use philosophy to understand the world. And so he doesn't say, Cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. He says in one place, homo cogitat, man thinks. Human beings do thinking. Doesn't matter if it's you or me. Alpha Say also says that Spinoza marks a departure from Hegel. Hegel talks about a transcendental subject, you know, this kind of part of the phenomenology of phenomenology of spirit that Hegel writes is about the kind of the, the journey of the subject towards absolute self consciousness and absolute knowing. But that kind of presupposes that there might be an end destination to knowing, to subjective, to self-knowledge. But Spinoza sees the subject, what it means to be you or to be me, as a process. And what we are is dynamic and it's changing. It's shaped by our social relations with others. It's shaped by our ideas about them. It's shaped by hope and it's shaped by fear. It's shaped by the need to believe in different things like fortune or not. The need for explanations. So maybe you might be seeing some resonances here in a way in this looking at ideology and power in terms of bodies and behaviours with what we've talked about previously, like with the Frankfurt School and advertising consumerism. Or in the early weeks when we we're looking at Roland Barthes, just kind of briefly in his idea of the kind of the anthropological myths of modern French society. You might also want to think about Franz Fanon and what he's got to say about colonialism too. Of course, what Spinoza is doing is kind of different, and we must remember his context. He's writing in the mid to late 17th century. He doesn't ever use the term ideology. It doesn't exist to him. He is not a, um, he's not a Marxist, <laughs> although it's interesting to compare Spinoza and Marx. He doesn't know about Marx, um, and Spino nor is Spinoza a revolutionary, although his thinking has all sorts of revolutionary consequences. 
In Spinoza's own time, the revolutionaries were those that wanted to um, overthrow the government of his day. But the government of his day in the Netherlands, the, what we sometimes call the Dutch Golden Age, was very and unusually liberal and republican. It was a place where philosophers across Europe could work and be in, live in exile like Descartes. Now, there were people that wanted to overthrow the state, but they were what we now probably consider far-right lunatics. Um, they were extreme Calvinists that didn't like freedom of speech, that wanted much more kind of, kind of social conformity. So Spinoza is very anti-revolutionary in his works. He's worried about insurrection. He's worried about sedition because he's worried that his government is a bit unpopular and it could be overthrown by a powerful, popular Calvinist movement. Nothing about the Netherlands that it's a republic, the Dutch Republic, doesn't have a king. But there is a very powerful aristocrat, House of Orange, William of Orange. And Spinoza's fears become confirmed. In 1672, the liberal Republican government is overthrown. Its leader and his brother are murdered and butchered by an angry mob with the connivance, we think, of William of Orange. And eaten. That man William, unless I've really got my history wrong, ends up becoming the a monarch of the UK, William and Mary. Now, Spinoza is sometimes read in response to Hegel. Pierre Macheret's Hegel or Spinoza is, a, is an interesting kind of work in this regard. Hegel actually really liked Spinoza. He said that, you know, philosophy has to begin from the standpoint of Spinozism. But Hegel found Spinoza problematic, as they say nowadays, um, because Spinoza in his ethics presents um, a, system, um, a philosophical system which seems complete and completely enclosed. And for Hegel, it doesn't allow for the possibility of creativity, of new ideas, of new thinking. Moreover, Hegel presents an interesting challenge, and it's, I think we could say it's a fair one, which is that how does Spinoza know? How can Spinoza, one human being in the 17th century, how is he able to produce a vast philosophical system that is able to account for substance, substance meaning everything that exists, not just physically, but also in through thought? How can one man kind of present a system that accounts for absolutely everything and everything within it and explain its underlying dynamics and processes? When Spinoza talks about God, he's talking about his God. He cannot know all God. Hegel basically thinks that by removing the subjective, removing the self, one's own perspective out of it, this is dangerous, it's, it's misleading. But Deleuze sees something important here, and this is what we need to kind of, this is going to get us back into Deleuze now. Deleuze is going to use Spinoza to overthrow Hegel. He doesn't like Hegel. Remember, Hegel has been very fashionable in France since the 40s, since the lectures of Alexander Kojev. It's had a big influence on Sartre and others. But there's fears about what this might mean. What it would mean for a philosophy that kind of has a kind of an end destination. An end destination where everything that is contradictory becomes incorporated or subsumed into the subject, into the same. So that all difference disappears. Deleuze is worried about the consequences of that. This is a quote from A Difference and Repetition, which is an important book. And Deleuze describes his contribution as part of a general movement at the time, a movement of generalised anti-Hegelianism. Quote, he's, he's talking about the Hegelian dialectic here. The dialectic makes, quote, identity the sufficient condition for difference to exist and be fought. It is only in relation to the identical as a function of the identical that contradiction is the greatest difference. The intoxication and giddiness are feigned. The obscure is already clarified from the outset. Nothing shows this more than the insipid monocentrality of the circles in the Hegelian dialectic. Monocentrality, one centrality. What does he mean? These are just some images of the Hegelian dialectic. If you're wondering what is the Hegelian dialectic, I know I covered a little bit in an earlier class, but it's he Hegel basically sees thinking as something that is not still, but is moving, it's dynamic. 
when we are thinking, when ideas are emerging, they begin as kind of propositions, as kind of creative ideas, as new ideas, but they always invariably come up against some kind of opposition, some kind of obstacle, or some prevailing orthodoxy. Now, what happens next is not that the original idea is simply accepted, you know, without condition, but there is some kind of merging of the two, a synthesis of the two, a sublation, and Alfie Ball, Hegel calls it, he doesn't use the, quite these terms. And so knowledge proceeds through kind of resistance, opposition, conflict, overcoming, development, change. Which I guess there's something kind of interesting and powerful about that, about thinking and maybe much wider life being defined by conflict. By these energies. But I think what worries Deleuze in that line is the fact that there is going to be an endpoint. That thinking needs to not involve one line but a multiplicity of lines. And this is going to be important for Deleuze. Right, let's get into practical philosophy. Let's get into this book itself. So here it is. And <clears throat> we've talked about this image and Deleuze's project of using Spinoza as a way of challenging Hegel, but also kind of in reading in Spinoza his own concepts too. So the backdrop to this, this book uh, comes out in 1970, let's bring it back up. And Deleuze has been doing important work in history of philosophy up until then. Um, he's been looking at history of philosophy in a radical direction, we talked about this, he looks at kind of overlooked people like Hume, Nietzsche, Bergson, then in 1968, we've got Expressionism, Expressionism in Philosophy, Spinoza. Um, and then this book is kind of like an, it's like an introduction to the study of Spinoza for a wider audience. And a big part of the book is actually a glossary where he gets key terms in the Latin in, for Spinoza, and then he gives definitions. But as much as this book is kind of meant to be like a study guide for Spinoza, it's actually like a really unusual, it's like different Spinoza appears. And this is what we're going to explore now in this part. It's a Spinoza of life, of joy, of the body, and of material power. A materialistic Spinoza. A Spinoza where God, Spinoza's God, as Albert Einstein you know, fell in love with, doesn't matter too much it's about how we live and how we live well. Deleuze says, quote, Spinoza offers philosophers a new model, the body. We do not know what the body can do. This declaration of ignorance is a provocation. This is a line that Deleuze makes a lot out of. It's something that Spinoza says in the ethics. We do not know what the body can do. We do not, sometimes it's translated. We do not know what a body can do. We do not know the powers of the human body. We've been too fixated on the ways in which philosophers in the past have tried to map out, you know, um, the human mind, but usually in a very ineffective way. You can imagine here that the that maps, you know, maps from the 10th or 11th or 12th century produced by monks in northern England, you know, which, you know, most of the map is, you know, full of sea monsters and, you know, um, the weird little bit human beings with, like, faces in their bodies and stuff like that. We do not know what the body can do. Spinoza's a philosopher then of the body. Now, in Spinoza's own context, new understandings of the body are appearing. We sometimes call these, call these understandings mechanistic, mechanical, mechanical understandings of of all bodies, of animal bodies. Descartes um, viewed animals as being no more than just very kind of clever, very well-constructed robots of nature. They don't have souls. They're just brilliant automata. We get a similar kind of study of nature in terms of mechanical cause and effect and different forces in Thomas Hobbes as well. And that's important for Spinoza. It's, a, it, it's emphasis on, on looking at human beings as simply enough a kind of being, enough a kind of animal, and not something specially chosen by God for some, you know, unique purpose far from it. This is definitely not Spinoza's thinking. Looking at all natural beings as within a web of cause and effect. Looking at the body, you know, taking off its skin, taking off its um, illusions, and thinking about what human beings can accomplish in terms of their power. And there's a lot in Spinoza's philosophy, which is about collective power, about friendship, about companionship, a lot about the goal of society being cooperation, a lot about democracy, a lot about the good of a life shared. That's what, one of the things I really like about his project. Now, like I said before, Deleuze sees Spinoza as a philosopher of life. This is another great line from Deleuze's book. 
In his whole way of living and of thinking, Spinoza projects an image of the positive, affirmative life, which stands in opposition to the semblances that men are content with. Not only are they content with the latter, they feel a hatred of life. They are ashamed of it, a humanity bent on self-destruction, multiplying the cults of death. I'm bringing these slightly gloomy images back bringing about the union of the tyrant and the slave, the priest, the judge and the soldier, always busy running life into the ground, mutilating it, killing it outright or by degrees, overlaying it or suffocating it with laws, properties, duties, empires. This is what Spinoza diagnoses in the world. This diagnoses in the world. This betrayal of the universe and of mankind. It's wonderful, isn't it? For some of you might know Spinoza's philosophy already. You're probably seeing here there's quite a partisan emphasis on Spinoza as an oppositional figure. He's against the you know the body of men, against much of humankind here, against the priest, against the tyrant, against the judge, against the soldier. All of these people are on the side of death, on on the side of control, on the side of power. Whereas Spinoza is on the side of life, on the side of the universe, on the side of humankind. So what Deleuze wants us to do with Spinoza in this book and in Expressionism is to think through, think in Spinoza and think through Spinoza. Think in, not just think about, but think in the world of Spinoza's concepts, but then use them to kind of, by implication, for to problems in our own times. As Pierre Macheret says, writing about Deleuze's approach, it is, the, it is an effort to communicate a philosophical thought from the inside, from inside it. So this is a radical Spinoza, a disruptive Spinoza. And again, like I mentioned, the emphasis on joy, human joy, and, and the affects. You might be thinking, what do I mean by the affects? Affects are, you could just take this as enough word for emotions, although they have a, a slightly more technical meaning that's different. Emotions, think about the Latin word, movere, um, something that is moving out of us, moving, motion, movement. Now, we often think, in in our own times of emotions in terms of feelings internal feelings but emotion and affect involve something that is like a bodily and mental reaction affects for spinoza are specific states um spinoza defines the affects are as something that we experience when our body um goes from transitions from greater or lesser power so we feel joy when we become more powerful and we feel sadness when we become less powerful so the goal in spinoza's philosophy is to become as powerful as we can using the, our, the human mind to understand what affects us internally and externally and so therefore it's not it's not a, you know it's, it's nothing too far out here so by implication spinoza's philosophy is one of joy to experience maximal joys the most joys lasting joys contentment and this is what this emphasis on joy is what we get in Deleuze. And this is just a lovely image of him here, you know, like kind of you can feel it. I think here that that oh, so I know we talked about last week in '68. Now it comes the happiness of the countercultural moment. Deleuze says, "Quote: Whatever their justification, they, meaning the sad passions, represent the lowest degree of our power. The moment when we are most separated from our power of acting, when we are most alienated." delivered over to the phantoms of superstition, to the mystifications of the tyrant. The ethics is necessarily an ethics of joy. Only joy is worthwhile. Joy remains, bringing us near to action and to the bliss of action. So this is what it's about. When, I, when we talk about, when you hear joyous affects, or you might have heard people using Spinoza nowadays and talk about the sad passions, that's what we're dealing with. Spinoza's philosophy, the ethics being about making us more powerful, experiencing greater joys. And reading and thinking in and through Spinoza is Deleuze's project in order to kind of release desires, amplify desires, amplify joy. Deleuze also says, and this is great, that we have not yet begun to understand Spinoza and I myself know more than others. I like that. There's kind of some modesty there. Also, as some of you know, Spinoza is a really difficult figure to understand. Okay, let's get into a specific part of the argument that I want us to dwell briefly on. And that is what um, Deleuze presents as the triple illusion. Now remember that Deleuze is very influenced by these two, the pair, Spinoza and Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche. 
and basically what Deleuze does is he kind of brings the two together in, in terms of thinking about how they both challenge um, received Christian morality in different ways. Both, of, you know, just as Nietzsche crit criticized Christianity, Judeo Christian Christian morality, as what he called a slave morality because it it didn't emphasize striving and activity and ambition, but instead said that it's better to be modest and humble and weak and repentant. He said this is, these are the features of a life denying morality. And so when Nietzsche, no, when Deleuze is, you know. It's talking about Spinoza as a philosopher of joy, but also a philosopher of life. It's kind of there's a Nietzschean inflection there. That part of living and the philosophy of life involves trampling over, knocking down the idols which you know make bodily life diminished or inferior in some ways. So Deleuze says, quote, There is then in there is then a philosophy of life in Spinoza. It consists precisely in denouncing all that separates us from life. All these transcendent values that are turned against life, these values that are tied to the conditions and illusions of consciousness. Before Nietzsche, so again, he's making this link between Spinoza and Nietzsche, Spinoza as a, um, you know, a precursor of Nietzsche. Nietzsche himself writes in a letter to a friend that, you know, he says he's, he discovers Spinoza one day and he says, you know, Spinoza is my precursor. And so Deleuze says, quote, before Nietzsche, he denounces all the falsifications of life, all the values in the name of which we disparage life. We do not live, we only lead a semblance of life. We, only, we can only think of how to keep from dying and our whole life is a death worship. Now, Deleuze isn't always being entirely radical. He's drawing on stuff which is very much present in Spinoza's ethics. In particular, in Spinoza, Spinoza's Ethics is a book that's in five parts. And at the end of the first part, there's a long appendix. And it's written in a very kind of, in a relatively plain, and very accessible way. And Spinoza talks about um, human understandings of creation. That all around the world, people kind of, different tribes, different groups have kind of come up with their own creation story in which they themselves are more favoured by God than other people's. But all of these stories, Spinoza says, are absurd. People have come up with these creation stories because they don't actually know what has brought about their being into existence. And instead, fantastical stories have developed, which are then you know, very much linked in with the ambitions of certain groups who want to control others, control others through the fear of death and the fear of the afterlife. But what makes Spinoza's project interesting is he, makes it, he takes this kind of psychological deficiency that we you know we we need we have a need to understand what affects us but we cannot explain it and he mixes that in with a an anthropology of religion so spinoza in the, in the appendix says quote all men are born ignorant of the causes of things that they all have a desire to seek their own advantage a desire of which they are conscious from this it follows firstly that men believe that they are free precisely because they are conscious of their volitions and desires Yet concerning the causes that have determined them to desire and will, they do not think, not even dream about, because they are ignorant of them. So we appear and emerge in a world in which we, we need things, and, and we therefore want things, things conducive to survival, to human pleasure in different ways. We want these things, and we seek, you know, we go after them, and in that we believe that we have some willpower, some willability. But Spinoza thinks this is... This, this capacity of free will is, a, is an overestimation. The things that we desire are caused by experiences and emotions and ideas that act upon us so that we're passive in them. You might be thinking here of like the unconscious mind, although Spinoza doesn't have, quite have, doesn't have the concept of the unconscious, it doesn't exist then. But he has a lot to say about how we think we're active from free will, but actually it's some other idea or memory or experience acting on us, and so we're passive and not active. There's so many complex and remarkable belief systems emerge around this need to explain. Need to explain what we need and why we can't get it. Need to explain our position in the world, why we're here, what happens after death. And they all take very different cultural shapes and turns and they usually end up having a strong <laughs> emphasis on social control, don't they? Spinoza is, not, is very much alert to this. In the same appendix he says, 
and he's talking, I guess, about priests here, the priests in general. They asserted that the gods direct everything for man's use, so that they may bind men to them and be held in the highest honour by them. So it came about that every individual devised different methods of worshipping God as he thought fit, in order that God should love him beyond others and direct the whole of nature so as to serve his blind cupidity, like blind desire, and insatiable greed. And so they will go on and on asking the causes of causes until you take refuge in the will of God. That is the asylum of ignorance. The will of God is the asylum of ignorance. I mean, you can see here what is so kind of radical or, or scandalous about these ideas. And this is part one of many reasons why Spinoza did not want his ethics to be published in his lifetime. He nearly does it. And then he's worried that he's going to be thrown in jail or he may be, he may be killed. You know, if he were to go to jail, he probably might die from the foul conditions there. So when Spinoza, when Deleuze talks about this, the triple illusion, keep this in mind. It's really referring in particular to part one appendix, you know, this whole view of how religious belief emerges. So in Spinozism for Deleuze, you get a triple denunciation. Spinoza um, denounces consciousness, or what I mean, free will. The idea that there are, there are objective, universal religious values. Spinoza thinks that they're instead culturally relative, and their real value should be in terms of facilitating collective human power. And then the sad passions. Spinoza denounces the sad passions. Fear, hatred, anger, they serve no good use to us whatsoever. The fear of death. Instead, for Deleuze, he reads these three things into Spinoza. Materialism, the idea that what only exists is matter, bodies. Immoralism, you know, he's kind of challenged to prevailing morality. And atheism, that Spinoza's God is so unconventional, he doesn't fit neither the Christian nor the Jewish mould. All of these are under threat. Free will. Final causes, this is the belief, um, this is the view that things that we should understand things acting towards a purpose. That we can understand when we look at the harmony of nature, evidence of a purpose, that um, a very clever God, intelligent design, or a watchmaker has made the universe for our use. This thinking is called teleology, study of pur purpose, purposeology, telos. We get in Aristotle. Aristotle talks about, you know, says that one of the ways that we can understand something in terms of the, the purpose, the function it fulfills. But Spinoza is sceptical about that. How do we know what the purpose really is? You know, we shouldn't look at things in terms of this. We should look at them in terms of what causes them. So this is something that I want us to talk about. The challenge, um, as so far as Deleuze sees it, to things like free will, to the kind of the, the orthodox basis of religious belief, of an orderly, harmonious universe over a human like God. Spinoza sweeps it all away. And instead we get someone that's you know, really quite different, quite radical. This concept, I mean, it's like an origami rhinoceros. I think, what, what on earth has this got to do with anything? Um, it re re refers more to Deleuze's other book on Spinoza, um, Expressionism. And it's the ways in which um, Deleuze looks at the ethics as doing something kind of different. That one thing that really excites Deleuze about Spinoza is this idea that all that we are all part of God, of God's power. Remember, God is God is God or nature. Spinoza equates the two in a couple of places. God is nature, you might you might say, is a kind of shorthand. Um, that we are all parts of God. We are all modes of God. And what Deleuze says, this is he's kind of one of his more radical takes on Spinoza. Is it, it's not just that we are parts of God, it's that God is made up of parts of us. So the important thing is not God as a totality, it's the modes, it's the parts of God, it's each of us. And what Deleuze does is he, he kind of sees Spinoza in a very kind of dynamic, you know, motion process driven way. We saw this discussion of process earlier, didn't we? That we, when we look at Spinoza, it should be in terms of speed and slowness. <laughs> Um, that life isn't a kind of a fixed essence like the, the rhino, it's something that is changing and becoming. It is, quote, a complex relation between differential velocities, 
between deceleration and acceleration of particles. Everything is moving, changing, becoming. Everything is therefore defined and shaped by its relations with others. So this kind of fits back to this concept of imminence, um, which is so important to Deleuze. Remember, Deleuze, is a, is, it, Deleuze reads Spinoza as a philosopher of life, but um, Deleuze himself should be read as a philosopher of life in this way. It, all of his thinking is about affirming life and becoming, becoming through four adventures, therefore, in thinking, experimentation in thinking. And therefore, there's this great resistance to anything that might slow thinking down or stop thinking or stultify thinking. Anything that might also stifle difference in some way. That's what he doesn't like about Hegel. Doesn't like the idea that we're going somewhere. Instead of one line, there's millions of lines. <laughs> Multiplicity. That's what we're after. And so when we're kind of trying to join the dots together, thinking for Deleuze and for Spinoza is something that is active, it's challenging, it's transformational. And it involves an understanding of our relations to others. That if this is a philosophy of joy, it's not just our own private joy. It's kind of bringing, sharing, experiencing joy and power with others. And that we do this thinking and this living to get together collectively. And therefore, then, there's a really important radical democratic project that by implication we can associate with all this. Hopefully. I don't know why that one <laughs> Obviously messed up the animations there. Um, I mentioned Einstein. Einstein says that his God is Spinoza's God. Just on the side. Einstein, I believe in Spinoza's God who reveals himself in the lawful harmony of the world, not in a God who concerns himself with the fate and the doings of mankind. So it's Godless, you know, I am a wrathful God, the jealous wrathful God of the Old Testament who punishes Job in order to kind of test his faith. But more the, the kind of the vastness the materiality of the universe, but not just the universe as an extended as a physical thing, but also the totality of what we can possibly think our ideas to. These are the two attributes of it, of of life, or one of two, that Spinoza says. Things physically exist, but things exist as ideas. Oh, okay, which is quite a journey of thought. Right, let's start wrapping this up. Um, well, I think we're going to wrap this up. Yeah, I think it's just many images after this. So this section will be a bit quicker. So Spinoza and us. So why? So we've talked a lot about Deleuze. Why would Spinoza be so interesting in this milieu of, of this moment? The Expressionism book comes out in 68. Spinoza Practical Philosophy comes out in 70. Well, you know, we know what's happened in that period. Maffron's book, uh, Individual and Community Spinoza, comes out in 69. Oh, you know, and then other books, the Alpha says, kind of teaching around this time. I'll mention some more names in a moment. Why is Spinoza important now? What's he gonna what's he gonna tell people? Well, it depends it's all about the way that Deleuze reads Spinoza. So Spinoza uh, for Deleuze gives us a philosophy of life. And he says in one point in this book that um he kind of presents three practical problems in the ethics. That, you know, we, and therefore, by implication, French society in August 1968, just, you know, not long after de Gaulle has come back in. Three things that we must confront. Number one, how does one arrive at a maximum of joyful passions? Number two, how does one manage to form adequate ideas? And it's from adequate ideas, these are like truthful ideas. And this is from which we can then become more active. Thirdly, how does one become conscious of oneself, of God, in Spinoza's God sense, and of things? So maximum joys, maximum understanding, maximum self-understanding. Deleuze continues, not that life is in thinking, but only the thinker has a potent life, free of guilt and hatred, and only life explains the thinker. The geometric method, the profession of polishing lenses in the life of Spinoza should be understood as constituting a whole. That's a really nice form. So this is meant to be an eminently practical philosophy of joy, of self-understanding, and of interrogating the, the hearsay, the opinions, and the beliefs of others. In that way, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, we might be able to kind of get somewhere to understanding why 10, 11 million workers could be on strike in 1968 
and then be kind of convinced to come back for what? Well, I mean, a huge wage increase. I'm sure many of us might have done that. Um, but the wider point is why, what is it that makes us choose something that is, you know, mediocre, that is disappointing, that involves drudgery? Symbols of consumerism. How do we get caught up in this? The, this material ideology, as Alfred Sayer said. Now, it may seem like a bit of a leap, but if we think about fear and the way that fear operates in politics, you know, this is so important for understanding the rise of the Nazis in relation to the defeat of the Germans um, at the end of the First World War and the kind of humiliation and trauma around that, fears of communist revolution, Spartacus but mainly the Great Depression and how that bankrupts and affects Germany, German pride, fear, fear of poverty, fear of loss. How do we go from a politics of fear and resentment to a politics of joy and life? This is what Deleuze wants us to think about. And it has an important bearing how we think about far about politics now, the appeal of far right politics. What does it mean to present a philosophy of desire and a politics of desire? How do we kind of re release ourselves from the thrall of charismatic hustlers? Hey. Now these questions do come up a bit in this book and they come up more in anti-Oedipus later. Why is it that people vote vote for dictators or you know vote for idiots? Deleuze asks it's like rhetorical questions. Why are the people so deeply irrational? Why are they so proud of their own enslavement? Why do they fight for their bondage as if it were their freedom? Why is it so difficult not only to win, but to bear freedom? Remember, that's an important existentialist question. Why does a religion that invokes love and joy inspire war, intolerance, hatred, malevolence and remorse? Now, these are just set out as questions in this book, but we do get an answer in Anti-Oedipus, which we'll look at next week. How desire can be liberating and how desire can be fascist, as they say, stifling, reactive. How we can kind of get caught up, you know, these are the um, fortune telling machines. Remember Adorno criticizing popular astrology in, in the United States in the early 1950s. How is it that we can come to, you know, believe in things as absurd as kind of fortune and things like this? A fortune that always seems to be one that kind of props up the existing order, like in the machine on the right. What are the things that really matter to a person? Number one, should I take a vacation? Will I make money this year? Is my position secure? Well, some of these are real, aren't they? Our own insecurity in modern capitalism. But others are the kind of, limit, the kind of fairly circumscribed range of desires that we can have. Pseudo-desires, pseudo-needs. Something that we talked about last week and bears on the Frankfurt School. Of course, there's a bearing on Jacques Lacan, who is also really interested in Spinoza. He was a huge, um, you know, kind of disciple of Spinoza in his teenage years. Remember what Lacan had to say about desire, giving ground to our desire. Adorno and Horkheimer and the Dialectic of Enlightenment talk about uh, Donald Duck. Now, Donald Duck is a, is a way of kind of American viewers watching themselves being richly humiliated and punished and being able to laugh at it and therefore make their peace with it because it's happening to an absurd cartoon character. The ways in which our, our own place and power is in, interpolated in us, as Alpha Sale would say, not directly, but indirectly. The ways in which we see other people humiliated and belittled. The ways in which we see other people murdered. The ways in which we see other people amplified and celebrated and praised, and the effects that has on the self. For our thinkers of difference, Foucault, Derrida, and in particular Deleuze, enough a world must be possible, and we get there in thought. We get this power in Anti-Oedipus later. Same question, again. That is why the fundamental problem of political philosophy is still precisely the one that Spinoza saw so clearly and that Wilhelm Reich rediscovered. Remember him from week, week two, I think. Why do men fight for their servitude as stubbornly as though it were their salvation? How can people possibly reach the point of shouting more taxes, less bread? Again, the philosophy of desire will come to this. So there's other important works in the Spinozan term with just really Deleuze because he's really interesting. Maffron is enough, but he hasn't really been translated that much into English. Etienne Balabar, brilliant man, lovely man. Spinozan politics. This is an, a very good book, which I recommend you pick up if you're interested in this topic. Slightly historical focus, but reads Spinoza 
um, in relation to kind of democratic theory. He kind of presents this image near the end of the book of Spinoza setting out the possibility of as many as possible thinking as much as possible, which is wonderful. Something that some of you might be familiar with, uh, Antonio Negri, Tony Negri and Michael Hart. In particular, their work, Empire, which came out in the year 2000 or thereabouts. They've written enough of books subsequently. This is, I mean, this is a really interesting and kind of empire in particular, slightly popular way of using Spinoza. Spinoza has enough concept of the multitude to present um, a revolutionary critique of modern communicative capitalism, information capitalism, um, and how it can be overthrown as an empire. Not by reference to the working class, which, you know, was talked about in a couple of weeks' time, is seen to be a category that's kind of disappeared in some way, hasn't really, but some French leftists take this view. Who is the proletariat? You know, what happened to the blue collar worker after deindustrialization? Well, they said, well, we need to have a new um, collective subject for um, human emancipation, human freedom, and that is the multitude. It's, you know, therefore, we can have everyone we want in it. You know, it can be, it can involve all the new social movements. We can have men and women, people of different races, and so forth. Another figure very much influenced by Spinoza, and someone that we've talked about in our course a couple of times already, usually in our Zoom classes, is, is the late cultural theorist Mark Fisher, who wrote the K-Punk blog. An absolutely brilliant man, wonderful man, and who used kind of Spinoza uh, to kind of think about the possibility of collective joy in you know democratic joy, communist desire. So what does it mean to be a Spinozist? Well, these are people on the radical left that have used Spinoza in creative and wonderful ways. But Deleuze sets it out very nicely in this book that we've been looking at. He says, quote, who is a Spinozist? Sometimes certainly the individual who works on Spinoza, on Spinoza's concepts, provided this is done with enough gratitude and admiration. But also the individual who, without being a philosopher, receives from Spinoza an affect a set of affects, a, a kinetic determination, an impulse that makes Spinoza an encounter, a passion. What is unique about Spinoza is that he is he the most philosophic of philosophers, teaches the philosopher how to become a non-philosopher, a non-specialist, a non-professional. So let's see how we get on, on Monday. These are the questions I want us to discuss. Why might there have been a turn to Spinoza in late 1960s France? What kind of Spinoza emerges from Deleuze's approach? And then at the end, I want us to think about the, the lasting relevance. In what ways is Spinoza still relevant? Or maybe is he not relevant today? So we're going to talk about this on Monday, 6 o'clock. I really look forward to it because Spinoza is my guy. And I've, um, well, I'll just tell you about next week first. Um, next week, we stay with Deleuze, but we're going to look at the Deleuze and Guitar connection. This is a wonderful trump card. Um, we're going to look at Anti-Oedipus, an unlikely bestseller. It's a dense work, so what I want us to do is not just read Deleuze's story, but also read Foucault. Foucault's preface is just a great statement from the period, but I'm also going to, I'm also going to give you an excerpt from chapter one. The book was um, conceived as being part of a series called Capitalism and Schizophrenia, and there's a lot of literature, a lot of psychoanalysis. It's written in a very unconventional way. Um, the sequel to the book is A Thousand Plateau. We're going to look at the philosophy of desire, but we're going to use it to talk about other um, Deleuze and Guattarian, Guattari's uh, concepts like um, the rhizome, the body without organs and things like this. So yeah, I really look forward to seeing what we make of Spinoza on Monday. Um, I've got a book coming out on Spinoza called Spinoza, um, what is it called? What's what the most recent title? Spinoza and the Politics of Freedom. Uh, that is going to be coming out probably at the end of this year. So I'm really interested in Spinoza in this world. So I cannot wait to talk about this with you. All right. Thanks very much.